the industry went through a period of very slow step-by-step -step adoption, really like walk, crawl, run type of scenario. And I think it's been in the crawl phase for seven years and we're just getting to the walking phase. Mm -hmm. I think we even have a chart where it looks like a step up like this every year. But I think 2024 will be the inflection point for call it mass adoption. When you're going to start hearing about all the players that are core to the global financial system announcing that they're using the technology. And then from there, it's just a matter of call it increasing adoption from the client side. Welcome to another episode of the Entangling Web3 podcast. Today, we're delighted to be joined on the show by Colin Butler. Colin operates at the intersection of financial markets and Web3 in his role as Global Head of Institutional Capital at Polygon Labs. He brings with him a wealth of experience from both domains, with an impressive 18-year career in financial markets before moving into the tech world. Today, we'll be talking with Colin about how institutions can adopt and are adopting digital assets and Web3 globally. Colin, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much, Jack. It is a pleasure to be here. Hey, Colin, how are you doing today? Doing well, Alec. Thank you. So Jack's already given a bit of an intro to you, but an 18 year career in financial markets. Could you tell us a little bit about that before you know, we go into the wonderful world of Polygon and what led you there? Uh, yeah, happy to. So I, at the risk of dating myself, I started on Wall Street in 2002. I was very fortunate to learn from a mentor who was a very senior person on Wall Street. He was pretty well connected with some of the true legends that sort of created the industry and the junk bond market and things like that. So I think I, I gleaned a lot of experience and insights that I think are pretty rare today. I think there's a whole generation of people that don't really have a lot of the training that you used to go through in old school Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I think it's very valuable in terms of call it like getting deals done or execution or mm -hmm. kind of creating your own reality. Because in order to do really big, amazing headline things that change the world, you really have to have this attitude that you just won't take no for an answer and you won't stop at anything to get it done. And then when you do, everybody's kind of like, oh my God, can't believe that happened. And, and because you know what the guys did before, you're like, actually, it's natural now after mm -hmm. sitting on the trade desk for X amount of years. Um, so, I, so I think the training was very helpful. Most of it was on the sell side, which I think a lot of people will identify with. It was an investment bank. And mm -hmm. I sat on an institutional equity trading desk. And then for the latter part of my career, I was actually on the buy side at a hedge fund, raising capital. And then I spent the last couple of years as head of institutional capital at Polygon. Ah, so what was the transition there from working in Wall Street? I'm just imagining, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street, that's the lifestyle that I think everyone pictures when they think of Wall Street before the 2008 crisis. But what led you to Polygon? What was the kind of the trajectory there? It's a weird one. So I had a friend and then I guess thinking back in 2017, Crypto and blockchain started becoming big and there, it was generating mm -hmm. a lot of noise. And I started getting phone calls from crypto hedge funds that said, yeah, we'll come over, raise capital for us. It's this new thing. And I was really listening to call it Jamie Dimon at the time or Neuro Rubini, Dr. Doom. And mm -hmm. people that I had a lot of respect for were in the camp that this stuff is like worse than the pet rock, you know, like internet mm -hmm. money going to zero. <laughs> and without taking a deep dive into it, I believe them. And so I passed over those opportunities. And I pretty much had a very negative impression of it, just coming from like what I was doing at the time and not really knowing much about it. I just said, that's not for me. And so in 2021, I had a friend who was on the hedge fund side and he was transitioning into raising money for a crypto fund. And I said, man, good luck with your career, right? Wish you all the best. You're going to torpedo yeah. yourself, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> but I said, tell me your thesis. And he said, well, you know, the top performing hedge fund last year in crypto is up 12,000%. And I was thinking like, you must have missed a couple of zeros there. Because back when I was in the game, we were trying to get 20 or 30%. And you, were a, <laughs> you were a hero. And I just said, what are you talking about? And he said, no, this is what people bought. Here's how the returns were created. And it started dawning on me that like, I don't care if you think this thing is just like a total piece of trash. Like you have to know what you're missing before you mix mm -hmm. this next 12,000. And so I started doing the deep dive, you know, you read the Bitcoin standard and then mm -hmm. you see the Netflix movie, the Cryptopians or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> the, the more you learn about it, it kind of like, it doesn't make a lot of sense at all until it makes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, you become red pilled. I think everybody has their red pill <laughs> sort of story. Mm -hmm. And that's how mine started. And then once I got, call it red pilled for the first time, now I'm like triple red pilled. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> 
way deeper down the rabbit hole than anyone has a right to go. <laughs> but I think once I started really internalizing what it meant and what a paradigm shift it was for the world, I couldn't sleep. It was mm -hmm. just like every bone in my body had to join this industry. So I, I started studying it very intently and started reaching out to firms. And within a pretty short period, I actually wound up getting a job at Polygon. Well, I think apart from overdosing on the red pill, I agree. I think a lot of people have this, people working in the Web3 world now and people who are super passionate about it. I think everyone has this similar kind of eureka moment story where it maybe passed them by for a few years. And then one night they stayed up all night. And read everything about it and suddenly like everything changed right it's it's a completely different paradigm that we're talking about so that, that really resonates with me certainly i'm sure alec as well getting on to where you are now and the role you have at polygon we're talking about institutional capital and presumably also then this idea of institutional adoption right which is a term we hear quite a lot in the media about web3 and, and digital assets generally so what do we actually mean by institutional adoption like what kind of institutions are we talking about and why is it important yeah, that's a great question. So I think of my role as sitting right at the crux, right at the intersection of the global financial system and blockchain. And when we're talking about institutional adoption, we're generally talking about blockchain as a technology. So you could think of Polygon as an infrastructure layer. It is something that large financial institutions would use as a utility, as a way to make their processes better, faster, more efficient. So the types of institutions that this is a product and a technology for are banks, large asset managers, and in general, financial participants that are looking to transfer value. So you could even think of people looking to settle, people looking to clear, but pretty much for any of the major participants in the global financial system, this is a solution to one or more of their challenges. That's a quite an important distinction that you've made there, because when most people talk about institutional adoption, well, in my mind anyway, they talk of cryptocurrencies, they talk of, say, these ETFs as like your speculative assets. Do you have a, it seems like you have a different de definition. Is that correct? The definitions, I wouldn't say are completely separate, mm -hmm. but I think it's a choice of focus. If you focus on what's happening in terms of ETFs and kind of the cryptocurrencies that are traded, you're generally less focused on rewiring the global financial system and often more focused on speculation. And mm -hmm. then you get more into the territory of regulatory. And I, mm -hmm. for my role as head of institutional capital, I tend to stay away from that territory because I think there's a lot of things that are to be determined in terms of clarity mm -hmm. and, and not yet decided. But what's very clear to me is that if you don't talk about the speculative aspects of it, there's still a massive use case for adoption. Yeah, I think we completely agree with that, right? And I'm really glad you used that term infrastructure because we're talking about protocols, right? These are, there are, these are new ways of transferring value, as you said, of tokenizing assets, making things liquid that weren't liquid before, enabling new use cases, new things you can pay for, new ways to pay. You know, I think it was Paul Buckheit, I think, the, the creator of Gmail, and he said Bitcoin is like the TCP IP of money, which I think is a really great way to, to frame it as infrastructure and is really interesting. So what do you see in terms of those institutions at the minute adopting it for infrastructural reasons or supporting it as infrastructure? Are there any particular use cases in mind you have when looking at institutions adopting? Yeah, definitely. And we have to double click on the TCP IP analogy. I, it's fascinating. And I think it's a very accurate analogy. I was going to say first there are specific use cases for why people would want, call it the Web3 version of TCP IP. A lot of those have to do with more efficient clearing and settlement and therefore cheaper costs. And I should also add administrative costs in there. So mm -hmm. it's this big idea that, especially when you're thinking of private assets or call it pieces of alternative asset managers, like shares of funds, this technology has the ability to wildly change that landscape. And so specifically what it would look like is if you think of a high level model and you look at where all the assets are held in the world, about 50% of those assets are held by individuals and it represents about $150 trillion. We might have to check my math afterward, by the way, um, but it's a gigantic amount. And so there's an idea out there that because private assets and hedge funds are largely inaccessible to the vast majority of that $150 trillion, for various reasons, and this technology can lower costs on the back end, 
and thereby take a minimum investment size of say 10 million or 5 million down to 20,000 or $10,000 and therefore expand distribution to a much greater percentage of the population, you can now get a situation where you go into your high net worth broker at call it a JP Morgan Chase or an HSBC or your private client banker. And in the future, not too distant future, he will say, Jack or Alec, you actually have essentially a 0% exposure to these higher performing assets, higher performing than the stock market, and you can de-risk your portfolio and diversify. I'd recommend a 20% allocation. Mm -hmm. And again, these were products that generally people under $30 million net worth didn't have access to because mm -hmm. The core challenge is the 1010C. It's a 10-year lockup, it's $10 million minimum, and it's a function of capital calls. And mm -hmm. fractionalizing shares of these funds and tokenizing changes that dynamic in such a way that these products will essentially be accessible to, say, people with a million dollar net worth. Mm -hmm. And what that does in terms of, if you think about the total addressable market, is it creates a situation where of the $150 trillion, if everyone has a 20% allocation into these new vehicles and new entities, then you're talking $30 trillion in mm -hmm. new market that currently doesn't exist, but likely will exist only using blockchain. And so okay. I guess the core of it is it opens up for one, a $400 billion revenue opportunity for just the alternative investment asset industry, yeah. investment management industry. And if you think about it from just layman's terms, that's a massive financial incentive for the traditional financial system to come on chain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also why, like why now it's because you now actually have the infrastructure that can create that. And now you've got the financial incentive. And so that's why I believe that there's going to be a rapid transition. And then we can get in. I wanted to set that framework first before mm -hmm. we go into That's almost like why TCP IP is needed. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And we are definitely going to, like you said, double click on the TCP IP. So a question that I was asked recently, because I made a similar point to that, maybe not quite as well explained as, as you just did. But there was the question was, I said, you know, it's going to open up this whole new world of tokenizing assets and fractionalizing assets, and that's going to improve accessibility around the world. And the question they posed to me was, why do I need blockchain for that? Why couldn't a JP Morgan of the world just do that on their own systems? How would you respond to a question like that? I think there's a lot of ways that you could respond, but one of them that's core to my understanding is it's a function of taking multiple ledgers and drawing it into essentially one. So I, I spoke with somebody very well placed at one of the core kind of backbone infrastructure providers for a lot of Wall Street, a lot of private equity. And they said, we have 23 different ledgers. And if you think about like the manual work that goes into transferring fund X to mm -hmm. ledger Y and Z, it mm -hmm. just sounds crazy in the current modern world when you can essentially distill it down to one. Yeah, And I think if you think about it that way, it's very easy to understand the cost savings involved and the time savings in terms of settlement and the efficiencies that are unlocked. And I think that's the core of the value proposition for blockchain is it takes a, between, depending on who you ask and what the use case is, it can take 50 to 90% of the costs of settling, transacting, moving things around on the back end or on the operational side of things. Mm -hmm. And when you take it down to that degree, then you can pass that cost along to customers. And that's where you really get the coming from the $5 million minimum to call it the $10,000 minimum. Yeah, that makes sense. I think my answer was just efficiency, right? It costs the margins on someone investing $10 aren't worth a JP Morgan of the world. But if I have this distributed ledger that stores everything efficiently and is immutable and everyone can see it, then it suddenly becomes far easier for us to merge those million times $10 to actually create something and buy into something like that. And one other thing that you mentioned there was, you know, use cases. I'd be really interested to know what do you think are some of the most compelling use cases that institutions are looking at right now? Is it like token? organization. I'm not going to lead your answers. Actually, I'll stop there. Uh, for me, it is. I, you know, I think some people would think that part of the field is a little bit boring, but for me, mm. that's, that's where the, that's where the juice is. Like I came to disrupt industries and this technology makes things an order of magnitude better in a lot of ways, more efficient, more effective, lower cost. So when I think about tokenization, what's my most exciting, I would say picture. It is really that for the first time, a lot of individuals could get access to call it like a Hamilton Lane, mid team. Ham Hamilton Lane is a almost trillion dollar private equity manager. Mm. Get access to one of their funds that's a 12 to 15% returning fund. 
creates a lot of diversification. It creates higher returns in a safer manner than I think a lot of vehicles for which people have access to right now can provide. And then on top of that, there's 24 seven trading and liquidity, and you can use it as collateral and borrow, no. borrow against it. So I think that the crypto vision of having full transparency and the benefit of borrowing it and using it in DeFi and with call it, call it the crypto native use cases, I think it's a very compelling value proposition for the customer for which there just was no no solution before. Yeah, yeah I think I 100% agree. That's part of what I mean when I say, you know, it enables you to do things that simply weren't possible before. Like, you know, if you take the fractionalization example, that could go into real estate now as well. And it is happening quite a lot in various different providers. You mentioned DeFi there, which is interesting. How do you see this the kind of adoption of DeFi between these institutions? Because one of the terms that we've heard a lot over the last year or so, definitely, is real world assets, the RWAs. That seems to be what I was, in, in my layman's terms, would be kind of, that's now the acceptable face of tokenization for lots of institutions. And then you've got DeFi, which is a little bit more, let's say, crypto native. Do you think the DeFi value proposition is starting to work its way into the wider institutional market? I do, but that part of it could take some time. Uh, the challenges there are regulatory. It would be what is able to be transferred without KYC, know your customer, mm -hmm. uh, without kind of compliance guardrails. I think that was the original concept of DeFi, but I think if you integrate DeFi within an institutional framework, I think the idea can work at scale in terms mm -hmm. of getting assets that are compliant, even securities that you can trade and borrow against in an electronic format only without the idea that essentially anybody can buy it anonymously. That part you might have to give up for at least a little while. But there is a situation now where you have, uh, call it KYC borrowers, but the lenders could essentially be anybody. So we're getting mm -hmm. closer to that, the vision for DeFi ultimately. We're getting closer on, on the spectrum to the original idea of permissionless kind of borrowing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I've, I've also seen the term uh, C DeFi, like centralized DeFi, the kind of <laughs> blending of the two, like the Web 2.5 of the DeFi world. And I agree, I think we're starting to see elements of the technology and the principles or how the DeFi systems have been created starting to make their way into how the larger companies and financial institutions are approaching their offerings and their products in the space, I think. On the RWAs piece then, do you think that is a do you think that's a useful term to be honest as well? Because I'd be interested to know. Do you think we need that term? Do you think we need this new way of describing similar things? Because in my mind, it covers a lot of the benefits that you were describing. But what are your thoughts on that kind of whole movement? To be honest, I absolutely hate the term. I hate the term RWA as real world assets. Yeah. I personally think it's misleading. I hope somebody mm -hmm. can come up with something better at some point. <laughs> I guess it broadly does encompass anything from call it art to real estate to fractional Netflix accounts. But I think a lot of the use cases that people are even excited about or see as potential use cases are much further chronologically speaking down the pipe. What's able to be tokenized now is things that are largely digital already. And that is a mm -hmm. lot of finance. It is stocks, bonds, mm -hmm. funds, derivatives, swaps, repos. A lot of the traditional financial instruments that make up the vast majority of even think of like DTCC is $2.4 quadrillion in settlements every year. I think a lot of those instruments are ripe for tokenization right now. And I think as you get into the broader landscape of what they call real world assets, it becomes a lot harder once you kind of see beyond that. Mm. I've always struggled with the linking of like physical goods to things that that's a tricky one, right? And there's people that spend their entire careers trying to focus on IoT device or RFID tags that will uniquely represent something that's in the physical world to the digital world. But that has not been solved in like many ways right now. Very cool ideas. But yeah, think about the real estate deed on my house. It's a cool idea to fractionalize my house. You know, I'd love to share 10 percent of that on a saturday hopefully they don't throw parties in the house but, you know in order to get true ownership of that you would have to go down to the courthouse and say hey i actually prove that i own this and that that's a huge challenge but i think with what what's been done so far in terms of the funds it's like those assets really already exist in largely a digital form and then the big unlock that needs to happen is really the regulatory aspect where you can essentially have dematerialized versions of that. You no longer need a traditional ledger 
and you can have a purely digital ledger. And that's really where you unlock the cost savings. But to me, I almost don't even think of those as real world assets, like as a stock mm. or real world asset. Or mm. I would say more like, fin I would almost separate financial instruments from the rest of the RWA picture. There's a lot of people that would hate me. They're like, no, I love X or Y. And I, you know, we, we talk with uh, somebody really cool. They tokenized it on Polygon, right? It's a wine fund. And I'm like, that is, mm. that's awesome, right? I, I'm really into mm. that. Person. But I think that there's just such a vast opportunity in terms of the dollar amounts and the total addressable market for call it disrupting traditional finance that that winds up being what we have to spend our time on just because it's such a it's low-hanging fruit and it's mm. massive in size mm. and like we kind of talked about some of the pros of you know, DeFi tokenization all this kind of stuff and the benefits of blockchain in the financial space what are the challenges you hinted at one there around regulation of a kyc and right now operating in a kind of an anonymous environment is not going to be allowed by the u.s government for example but are there other challenges that you see to the adoption of this kind of stuff? I definitely think regulatory is the big one. I mm -hmm. think up until recently, it was technology. Like the just the technology wasn't there. We'll get into this, I know, later in, in the show. But the advent of zero knowledge proofs allows for very few trust assumptions, a much higher level of security. And if you're going to move billions and billions of dollars over the blockchain rails, that's really what you need. I think there's another factor that I would add, and it's cultural. You know, I think a lot mm -hmm. of big traditional financial institutions speak or still speak speaking with regulators. And the idea that public blockchain is acceptable is it, it's not for, for them, right? <laughs> there, there's a lot of fear. But I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding around what it means mm -hmm. to have these assets on public blockchain. And I think people are coming around. So I think in the near future, you're getting past that inflection point, like where, you know, this is kind of where people are very skeptical of call it public blockchain, but now you're getting to this curve where people are like, okay, this is, it's definitely happening and hmm. you got to get on board because that's where everything's headed. So you're starting to see the first big examples of people that tokenize even on public blockchain. So I think the adoption curve is kind of right at that point where it's, it's just going to continue to happen regardless of any obstacles that we still face. I think there's just enough momentum in the system now to allow it to sustain on its own. One of the things I saw here is like, say that people say, okay, the US government could stop Bitcoin or stop US, US citizens access to Bitcoin. And it's like, you know, you can't stop Bitcoin. You can't close Bitcoin. You can just limit your people's access to something that is a highly profitable and very beneficial solution that's going to be used elsewhere. And you're just pushing that kind of interest and market to other areas. I think governments are slowly starting to wake up to this fact. The only people that are going to hurt by having too heavy a regulation on these things is their own citizens, right? 100%. And you're also ceding the advantage to other nations. So if you think about how far further ahead of the curve, places like Singapore and Abu Dhabi slash Dubai and Hong Kong are and parts of Europe, and you're the US, you're just thinking there's going to be a lot of money made, there's going to be a lot of first mover advantage that gets taken away from mm -hmm. you know, the regulator, I sit in the US. So the regulator here, and I think they look at that and it probably gives them a little bit of FOMO if I had to guess. <laughs> yeah, I think the cultural aspect is really interesting. I'm glad you brought it up. And again, this it's almost like the whole philosophy of a distributed network and how Bitcoin works kind of bleeding into geopolitics almost now as well, right? Because, you know, Bitcoin is this big competitive system where you have different people trying to earn the money for mining and things like that. And now you have different countries considering, well, how are we going to play in this market? And as you said, with the US, lots of people who would like to be playing in that market are basically not prioritizing it because of the lack of regulatory clarity and everything. It's almost like we're seeing the what happened with the bit license in New York many years ago, kind of re replaying almost in the modern day. So you also mentioned the tech aspect, right? And the fact that you think the tech problem is actually less of a challenge now, which I think I also agree with. And you mentioned zero knowledge. So I think there's a nice segue to start to talk a bit more detail about Polygon. So we haven't actually covered Polygon before on the show. So it'd be great if we could hear from you, you know, just a high level, what is Polygon? What's the value proposition? And yeah, wh wh why is it so exciting? Yeah, I think the core idea of Polygon at this point is really the best suite of Ethereum scaling solutions out there. Why Ethereum? I think Ethereum is, you guys could probably correct me, it's up to probably 800,000 validators. I might be like 200,000 behind at this point. The numbers keep moving away from me. But the idea is that it's extremely decentralized. There is an extremely high level of security. And so we view Ethereum as essentially a global settlement layer. 
And our mission at Polygon is to really give people access to that global settlement layer in a cheap, fast, and very secure way. And with what Polygon is working on in terms of zero knowledge and its vision for Polygon 2.0, we think we're getting very close to that goal. And I guess for just the audience out there, Polygon 2.0 has a deep desire. The mission is really to aggregate a lot of the pools of liquidity out there in a very scalable way. So the headline would be unlimited scalability and unified liquidity. So if you think right now, and this goes back to TCP IP, there is a bunch of different blockchains, call it competing blockchains. And what we are looking to do is create an aggregator layer that attaches all these blockchains using zero knowledge technology. So there's very few trust assumptions. And I think the end result is you get to a user experience where you don't know that you're bridging between different blockchains. Mm -hmm. The idea is that in under five seconds, you'll be moving between blockchains, but you as a user won't actually know that you're doing it. And your transactions will settle in a very secure way to Ethereum. And that's really the vision for Polygon 2.0. Okay. It's, it's a yeah. massive paradigm shift. I don't think a lot of people are really aware of what it means, but back to the TCP IP vision, you could think about like, if, if you had the same structure for the early internet, this would be like Amazon and eBay. And in <laughs> 1998, you would have your Amazon token. You'd have to bridge it out to get the eBay token. And that's a user experience that nobody wants, right? That's yeah. not the user experience that creates mass adoption for web 2.0. And in Web3, we have to solve for that. And I think Polygon 2.0 will will go a long way to solving that uh, challenge of disaggregated liquidity. I, I think there's so many little strands there that I want to pick on. Maybe first, could you kind of bring in this idea of layer two scaling solutions and also connecting blockchains together? Now, we've got an upcoming episode that goes through this, the difference between L0, L1, L2. You've also got the term sidechain out there as well. But I think this is a concept that people are getting much more comfortable with, right? It's relatively new, I'd say, but it's now something that is, you know, through the popularization and advancements in zero knowledge tech, that is now something people are much more comfortable with. So how would you describe Polygon 2.0 in those definitions? Is it an L0? Is it an L2, a sidechain? Or do you think that doesn't matter? Is that like the irrelevant question here that I'm asking? Actually, I think it's very relevant. I don't think anybody's really come up with a firm definitive answer. Uh, so layer two at its core would have the ability to roll a bunch of different transactions and submit them all to the layer one in one proof and thereby saving a lot of costs. So if you think of the idea that Ethereum costs can be very high at times, gas fees can be very high. If you can lump a thousand transactions and submit just one down to the Ethereum layer one, it's essentially like whatever you were paying before divided by X amount of transactions and you get just a wildly lower cost with call it a layer two solution. But the reality of this new vision is that you can also connect layer ones with the technology, right? So there's a future vision where there's a bunch of very visible blockchains out there. There's call it Avalanche and Ripple and even private chains, right? Like Hyperledger. And if you can connect those using the technology that is pretty cutting edge. It's still being developed, but I think very close to rolling out at scale for those specific applications. Then all of a sudden you're not really talking, you're definitely still talking about layer twos because our vision is that we do want to settle to Ethereum. So that solution, they call it the aggregator layer where you aggregate all the liquidity and it settles to Ethereum. That will, I think, always be a layer two. But if you have layer ones porting into that unified liquidity system, what do you call that? I you just call it aggregated liquidity, right? Or, uh, you know, somebody has to make up a new cool, I think, buzzword to distill it for everybody and make it more simple, get away from the jargon. And it makes sense, especially when you're defining these things in the context of protocols that are underlying everything, right? And I think one of the things that everyone kind of says is there'll be one blockchain in the end and everything will be built on top of that blockchain. But we're kind of not seeing that right now. We're seeing a couple of like front runners, but there's so much stickiness involved in companies developing on blockchains that there's a real reluctance in a lot of ways to port. You know, if I spend 10 years building on Ethereum and all of a sudden someone's like, well, let's move to, I don't know, Cardano or something like this. There's a lot of reluctance there because of the sunken cost fallacy. And I think there's more and more potential for people like Polygon and companies like Polygon that are developing these interoperability, portability bridges between all these different ecosystems. Like one of the examples I like to give 
is like the metaverse, right? That's a taboo word right now. But we don't want a thousand different worlds all building in isolation. The beauty of a distributed ledger technology really should be that everything can be working together and transparently kind of working between different worlds. And I see a lot of value to this. Like I see, I think I really like Polygon's mission is, is to unify a lot of these kind of fractionalized ecosystems and bring them together and do that at a high speed and a low cost, hopefully. Well, if you remember, there's also competing versions of TCP IP. Mm -hmm. And I think as people, and maybe even it wasn't even the best, if I recall correctly, necessarily. But I think as you create a liquidity pool that becomes larger and larger, eventually everybody has to coalesce around that. Otherwise you have mm -hmm. essentially like a useless scenario where you just have a tiny island of liquidity out here. Yeah. And I think uh, TCP IP was a very classic example of that. Like once it got past a certain volume, it's kind of like Facebook. Like once all of your friends are on Facebook, there's no incentive for you to go to another network. Once once there's a depth of market where all the buyers are as a seller, you have to go because that's where you, that's where you get best price. So I think that as I believe the different islands of liquidity coalesce, you get a massive flywheel. You get a, an explosion of network effect of liquidity. And I think that's really what we're on a mission to create. And it's not exclusive. It's not at the expense of other blockchain ideas and the technical debt that people have created. It's like, no, we think based on this technology, you can keep everything you've done. And we're just going to combine it. Because if you're over here, say you're Polygon proof of stake, and we just combined a large source of liquidity, both sources just benefited mm -hmm. in a huge way. And that's, I think, the key to the vision for us. I really like that outlook, this idea of you know, network effects and what have actually grown Bitcoin. You've seen over the years the troubles that get caused by splintering of you know Bitcoin itself with the forks, with other chains forking and having different developers go off in different directions. It is it is much more beneficial to kind of unify liquidity, to unify the security as well of the blockchain, which is really interesting. So we've mentioned zero knowledge a couple of times. And again, this is not something that we've done a deep dive on on the show yet, but we will be very soon. So when I first heard of this technology, only four or five years ago, personally, I was a little bit late to the party, maybe, but it was, you know, still relatively new, even though lots of the primitives have been around for a long time. The advancements in the space of ZK tech right now are just, you know, you can't keep up with them, right? There's so much happening. So why do you think zero knowledge has been the kind of key to unlocking all this layer two and the scaling solutions for Ethereum? Because if you look at something like Bitcoin, they went on a different direction and they thought, okay, Lightning Network, this is how we're going to do L2 scaling. And Ethereum has very much taken the this new approach with zero knowledge, right? And also Polygon. So yeah, what is the difference in the distinction with going the zero knowledge route? And why do you think it's so powerful compared to maybe other scaling solutions? Zero knowledge is extremely important for unifying liquidity with minimal trust assumptions. I think what's been proven over the last couple of years is almost all bridges can be hacked. And so mm. you can't afford to take bridge risk when you're thinking about jumping between chains or pools of liquidity. That's what zero knowledge does very well, is it's the most secure way to transport value across chains in between liquidity pools. That's why it's so important. Two years ago, a little bit before I joined Polygon, there was this idea that zero knowledge would be three to four years out or five years out, mm. or maybe even never, kind of like the self-driving car is now. <laughs> oh, it's next year. Um, but Polygon actually, I think, did a great job of discovering or this idea early and really focusing on it. And what they did was they spent a billion dollars to buy the best projects in the space. Mm. They said, we're going to make all of our solutions, we're going to build them all around this technology because we think that it is the best. And right now it actually looks to be the holy grail. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. we'll know for sure until it gets a Lindy effect, like three to five years from now, or, or maybe more, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but right now it's the thing that we have the most visibility on in terms of the most viable solution. If you look at, call it like an optimistic rollup, it's a competing idea. I think, I think it was Ben from Optimism that actually said, we started with optimistic rollups because we didn't think zero knowledge was possible. Yeah. And the challenge, of course, with optimistic rollups is it's like this seven day kind of settlement window. It's just a challenge with the user experience. And by the way, that could be a great experience for maybe like a game or a gaming company that doesn't need that high level of security. But if we're talking the financial use cases that are a big part of my role, then you really need very few trust assumptions. You need the absolute highest level of security. 
zero knowledge provides that. And just for the lay audience, really at its core, what it does is it allows you to prove that you know something without actually showing the math by submitting a proof. It's very technical. I don't know the math myself. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I feel like it would take me a lifetime. The people that I speak with at Polygon that do these people are next level and I have massive <laughs> respect for them. But I think just understanding the concept is very important. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I'm really glad that you kind of defined the need and the importance for it that if you have a secure system like ethereum and you're bringing funds from somewhere else that's another secure system well the bridge becomes the weak point potentially so you really need to emphasize security and privacy in those bridges and like you say there's been a lot of hacks a lot of news a lot of events and maybe some, some skepticism around bridges because of this and it's really important that you know Polygon emphasizing that ZK, it provides this super secure, super private way of doing all of this computation in the background. How have institutions responded to that? Because like you say, it's a bit of a, a black box in a way, right? It's kind of like AI. You say it does these things. How does it do it? I don't know. There's some guy in the back who can answer that. But how have institutions responded? Yeah, it's similar to the internet. You know, we all use it. Uh, I remember my parents thinking for the first, again, dating myself, they said, we can't put our credit card on the internet. Like that's the craziest idea. <laughs> Right. And now all of us essentially take it for granted. And I think it's very similar to blockchain. The institutions need to know the outcome and they just need to have trust in the people that are telling them what it can do and providing the solution. And very, very much like any technical solution, the business leaders that would love to incorporate this into their, call it into their process, definitely don't know the tech. I mean, especially in Web3, the tech is so complicated. But they really need to trust the engineers that are working on the tech. And I think that's the point that we're at. These people at, call it large global banks or asset managers, have people in-house that know it really well and speak for it. And then, of course, you also need a trusted third party. If you're you know, conveying or purveying a software solution like this, you also need that trust both internally and externally. So an example of that would be Polygon, right? We have a whole team devoted to institutions to help educate people mm -hmm. uh, in order to convey that trust over time. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. What I think that I'd like to ask is around, is it ever going to happen? I don't know. But Ethereum 2.0, how does that affect Polygon right now? Is it in the mindset? Is it affecting the angle, the vision for Polygon? Who knows when it's actually going to happen, but I'm sure it's something that's talked about at Polygon. It's a little bit too far out in the future. In crypto, you think in terms of weeks, if not days, <laughs> even a year is a, it's like a lifetime away. We don't. I don't think we think about it a lot. I think we're really focused on this whole idea of just unifying global liquidity. And that is, that's the most important interim step for us because the focus is the, call it getting to that next billion users. Like how do we onboard the next billion users? How do we make it a user experience that people want, a, a customer journey that people want to go through? And so I think one of the major steps is global unified liquidity. It is again, really creating that like TCP IP that no matter what part of the blockchain ecosystem globally you're in, you can now connect mm. that kind of foundational layer. Yeah. I think I'm sure people within Polygon have thought beyond that, but it's completely TBD. Like we don't know the timing, we don't know the feasibility, but in the meantime, we've identified a target that I think can really help change the world for everybody that's involved in using this technology. Yeah, I think that's really important. Like when I initially heard about Polygon and I heard about Ethereum 2.0, I was like, well, you know, Ethereum 2.0, the whole point is to speed things up, more transactions. Like, why do you need a layer two? But having understanding this angle now that it's far, it's much more than that, right? Like you said, this aggregate layer that can connect lots of different disparate EVMs and also other layer ones and other blockchains together. I think that makes a lot more sense. And I see that that's a much bigger picture than just speeding up Ethereum. Yeah, but also you're going to need wild amounts of, of TPS, you know, mm. throughput and speed if you really want to make this technology as usable for as many people as currently are on the internet. So Ethereum yeah. 2.0, you know, again, you're getting like Visa and MasterCard and DTCC and all the banks on the same network, you're going to need a lot of scalability there. So I, yeah. I, I wouldn't, I, I'm generally like the more scalability you can get, we're going to need, we're going to need every bit that you can create. Yeah. And Ethereum's roadmap, it assumes all of this scalability that happens on like layer twos and side chains. I think they know this, right? There's, they're not going to be able to hit the bandwidth that is going to come from, like you say, 400 million transactions a second from Visa, I think is the equivalent. Like, they're never going to hit that on their own. Yeah. I think Vitalik has had that idea in his mind for a long time that this would be part of their solution for scaling. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting kind of distinction as well, right? Just saying it's part of the solution because I think some people maybe jumping kind of 
too far ahead and thinking we're just going to use layer two. But actually, there is still a lot of work happening on layer one, again, with ETH2. And I think the end state will obviously be this combination of the best scaled underlying blockchain at layer one, and then the best kind of probably ZK solutions on top that offer all the security benefits, but also the scale to do it. And it's not a case of one or the other. I think some people pit them one against each other far too often when they're talking about them. Colin, I really want to know just before we kind of get towards the end of the show here, what is the day to day like for you as, a, as head of institutional capital? What does that actually mean in terms of you know, institutional adoption and, and what it means for Polygon? It's a lot of education. So I speak with many of the top 20 to 50 global institutions out there. Some of these folks are very sophisticated. And so for me, I, I get the excitement of working on something that's right at the cutting edge because I get to hear from all the people that are deploying the technology for almost even future use cases. So you mm -hmm. think through a lot of hypotheticals, you understand what the tech can and can't do. And then you think through how to connect it in such a way that it creates a solution for players that are endemic, like they're right at the core of the global financial system. So for me, that part of it's really cool. Uh, so it's really, I would say one education and two connectivity. It's really connecting these players mm -hmm. together in a way that it makes sense for them to be able to roll out a solution that quite frankly, for me, I think has global impact. I think um, that's really important. We've seen so much of the detriment and the failure of the blockchain space and the Web3 space has been a lack of desire to solve real world problems. Like it's just been pure focus on the technology, like how are we actually engaging with industries to work out? Does this actually solve a problem that they have right now? So this kind of work is incredibly important. One question I would like to ask Art is, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you're seeing from engaging with these sometimes not tech savvy, sometimes not blockchain savvy individuals and trying to help them understand the space? Off the top of my head, I think the biggest misconception is lack of transparency. The, the idea that criminals can use this technology to get away <laughs> with you know, money laundering and things like that, it still happens. Probably mm. less than the traditional financial system, if I had to guess. <laughs> I mean, what people don't realize is it's actually, it's all about transparency. It's very easy to track if you're a malignant actor. So <laughs> I would say the biggest misconception right now is that if you go on public blockchain, you're going to be front run by people and every, everyone's going to know what everyone else is doing. And it's going to unleash this wave of criminal activity. I, from my personal experience so far, that's just that it's the opposite of that. There's organizations out there that are very good at tracing every block and every transaction that anybody ever does. So if you're a criminal out there thinking about using Polygon, it's probably not a great idea <laughs> uh, or Bitcoin or any of the other um, yeah. technologies. So I would say that's probably the largest misconception is the idea that going on public blockchain is either a good idea if you're a criminal or a bad idea if you are a traditional enterprise. Yeah, I actually wrote an article about this years ago, right? So this hasn't changed this perception that it's great for doing crime because typically the criminals do get caught in a very, a very big way. And they've got this beautiful tool in the blockchain to help them do it. And I often find that you have people on what one end of the spectrum who are saying it's completely, you know, criminal money and it's a, it's a great tool for crime. And then all these other people who say, oh, it's not private enough, right? And there's, there's often not enough people in the middle who are like, no, it's actually, it's a traceable thing, but you can have privacy if you want it. That's the ultimate kind of end state. So speaking of spectra, I want to ask you a bit of a cheat question, right? I want to talk about the future and the past at the same time. So if we have a spectrum of adoption for digital assets, Web3, whatever you want to call it, going from all the way back in the Wild West days of crypto to the ideal end state of hyper tokenization, hyper blockchainization of the world. Where do you think we are now on that spectrum, on that journey? And how far do you think we have to go? And how do we get there? So when you asked the question, my mind immediately was thinking like X-Men days of future past. I'm like, how do I time travel? But I think succinctly, the industry went through a period of very slow step-by-step -step adoption, really like walk, crawl, run type of scenario. And I think it's been in the crawl phase for seven years and we're just getting to the walking phase. I think the walking phase is short. And I think if you look at the spectrum of call it tokenization and mass use for the global financial system, I think 2030 is a good year to think of like HSBC's projected number of $19.2 trillion on chain. And I think they even have a chart where it looks like a step up like this every year. But I think 2024 will be the inflection point for, call it mass adoption. Actually, I think it was really 2023, but nobody really heard of it yet. And now 2024 is when you're going to start hearing about all the 
players that are core to the global financial system announcing that they're using the technology. And then from there, it's just a matter of call it increasing adoption from the client side. Yeah. And I think to go back to the TCP IP, like we, we need this technology to be invisible. People shouldn't know about it, right? Like there's too many companies in the past 10 years that have led with, we're a blockchain X, Y, Z, and we do these things. And you're like, no, never lead with that. No one cares about TCP IP. That's the boring stuff. You just tell them about the properties, tell them what it does, tell them how much it costs. That should be the angle. And yeah, I think you're right. Task. <laughs> yeah, true. I think you're right, Colin. We are coming to that or the killer app moments, hopefully. And we've seen it with ChatGPT, how AI is the new buzzword. You want to abstract away the tech. That's yeah, exactly. Part of the goal. Exactly. Sure. So we're coming to the final section of this really fantastic episode. So we like to ask two constant uniform questions to each of our guests and see how the answers change over time and the change between industries and all this kind of stuff. So the first question is, in one sentence, what is Web3 to you? Man, I hope I get these right. I don't want to compare negatively <laughs> to everyone else. Web3 to me is full alignment. And if I were to explain that in a longer sentence, it would be the idea that the creators and engineers of the network are paid in the same token as the users of the network. And therefore everybody is incentivized to contribute to the network. And one party isn't necessarily taking advantage of another. That was the long sentence version. I like that. I think that's one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin, right? Is that the very people that are maintaining the health of the network are also using the network to exchange and using the tokens to exchange. And that was one of the beautiful things about it. I like that answer. The two word answer. So the first two word answer we've had, that's imp impressive. And the second question is, if you could choose anyone alive, dead or fictional to sit down and discuss Web3 with, who would it be and why? See, I've got a cheap answer for you, though. I would say Satoshi. How cool would that be? That's the uh, most popular answer we've had, I think. Oh, uh, yes. Say that. I, I should have uh, screened <laughs> the other episodes. But then, of course, like I think Vitalik is a very well-known thought leader. Uh, we have people at Polygon that are, I think have a good relationship with him. I think it'd be fascinating. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'd take half an hour out of his day to hang with me, but I think that would be really cool just because his ideas generated an entire industry. So massive amounts of respect to Vitalik. And I just personally would be interested in hearing just about anything that he has to say, because I think he's a visionary. Yeah, great answer. I 100% agree. I mean, luckily, he's very active in the space, right? So maybe, hopefully, you'll get that chance one day. But Colin, it's been a really exciting and enjoyable episode for me. I've learned a lot, certainly, and I've really enjoyed talking to you. So yeah, thank you again for joining us. And all that remains then is to say to our audience, thank you for listening wherever you may be. And make sure you join us next time to untangle a little more of Web3. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Untangling Web3, produced by Emma Camilleri. Don't forget to send us your thoughts, questions, and comments on social media. And be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast provider to catch the next episode. See you next time to untangle a little bit more of Web3. The views we express here are our own and do not reflect the views of our employers.